welcome. My name is Nicholas. Uh, I'm COO at our census, but for the next 45 minutes, I will be your host for this webinar and uh, yeah, lead you through the journey. So today we have a very special topic. Uh, it's our second part of the new webinar series, Unexpected Diagnosis based on whole genome sequencing. Uh, we already have the first part, so we'll tell you about real life cases where we use whole genome sequencing um, to find a diagnose. And before we get too much into detail, uh, I would just like to take this chance to thank all of you for joining in. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure to have you on board. It's uh, inspiring to see how many people are joining in from all over the world, and we're glad to have you on board. Um, perfect. So before we go too much into detail, I won't uh, talk for long, so we'll get straight into the point. Um, just a quick update from my side. We invite all of you to um, ask questions. This works as usual. So we'll have the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you click on this Q&A icon, um, there will pop up a window. We can write your questions. And if you type in your questions and click send, these will appear uh, for us. And uh, our colleague, Dr. Bola Skaina, she will join in after the first presentation and uh, make sure we answer all of your questions. If there should be any left at the end, um, don't worry. We will write down the answers and then send them to you via email afterwards. Perfect. So um, it's not only a special topic, because this is the second part of our webinar, but it's also a special topic, uh, which most of us have been looking forward to, because we have the honor to listen to our CEO and founder, uh, Professor Dr. Arndt Rolfs himself. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, he's a, a very experienced neurologist with over 30 years of experience. He's an entrepreneur, uh, and um, more specific, he's a visionary when it comes to the application of genetics in modern medicine. And uh, next to that, he's also a professor for neurology at the University of Rostock. Uh, he's an international adjunct professor of neurology at Shahid Zulfikar Medical University in Islamabad. And he's an honorary professor at the Institute of Child Health Children's Hospital in Abu Pakistan. And lastly, he's an honorary doctor at the Medical University of Tehran in Albania. So um, always very close to the patients. And that's why we're really looking forward to uh, listening to you today, uh, Arndt. Uh, it's going to be excited to hear uh, what case you are presenting today. So, very welcome. The stage is yours. Niklas, thank you. Uh, thanks especially for the nice intro. And also thanks to the audience as always. And happy to discuss with you today, indeed, some interesting cases. However, before I would like to discuss with you the cases, I would like to present you some very uh, thrilling news that was published uh, just very recently and that has a direct impact on the interpretation of the data we are producing and uh, therefore allow me to quickly present to you the, uh, the paper published from the team from David Nurk in Science end of March, so not even uh, four weeks ago. That team has published now the real whole genome sequence. We can also call it the reference genome. And let me just remind you, whenever we are sequencing, especially for the genome, we need a reference with, what, with that we are comparing the resulting data from our patients. So this reference genome, also named T2T, because it's the first time that the chromosomes did, did get sequenced from telomere to telomere, therefore we call it T2T, that really fills the gaps we had still existing in the last years. And these gaps are resulting typically because of highly repetitive regions or partially regions that had a poly A strat, therefore really difficult to be sequenced with the traditional sequencing technologies. The most important contribution to this T2T -T project was coming from the long read next generation sequencing, especially from the company PacBio using their technology HiFi. And at the cartoon on the left side, you see in red labeled those stretches in the different chromosomes where we have received the most significant additional information based on this long read stretch sequencing published in the paper. Um, let me just show you on the next slide, 
also those chromosomes where we have received the most significant impact. That's chromosome 15, chromosome 13, 22, 14, and 21. But the slide before, you have seen that also other chromosomes are um, showing slight changes based on the red color that is being presented here. What is the take home message from that, in my opinion, really revolutionary paper? On the one side, now the complete human genome is available, resulting in 3.055 billion base pairs covered from telomere to telomere. Several corrections have been made in comparison to our up to that time point used reference, internationally used reference HD38. Therefore, it reflects the most complete genome that is actually available. It allows us a significantly better alignment of raw data we are producing. It eliminates false positive variants. It has also included 269 medically relevant genes. And it has also solved, and I will show you some examples of that, falsely collapsed or duplicated regions. We have implemented in the meanwhile, the usage of the T to T information. And I would just like to show you some examples. So in the upper lane named HG38, you get the impression that there is a gap. Typically such a gap would be analyzed as a deletion However, this is a pseudo deletion because if you compare it with a lower lane data resulting from the T2T -T and aligning our data with the T2T, -T, you can easily see that this was an artifact resulting from the existing HG38 sequence. And therefore the T2T -T is now perfectly solving it in the future. The next example, you see, uh, check the upper lane with all of the colorful boxes in red and blue and green and so on. Uh, these are all mutations, so called mutations that has been presented by the HC38 being the reference. Using now the T2T -T as the reference, you see significantly less of these colorful boxes that again underlines that these are artifacts also resulting from the HD38 being used in the past as a reference that makes the interpretation of the data much easier for us because here we have reduced the artifacts. Or take a further example where you might see in the upper lane in the right half, this accumulation again of the colorful boxes uh, this is a repetitive region that was always generating problems in the adequate interpretation. Taking now the T to T as the reference, you see it's easy solved. And, uh, again, the alignment with the patient's data is now massively improved. And the last example I would like to show to you, you may be aware that we have, especially in neurodegenerative disorders, so-called repeat expansion diseases. That means a disease like Korea Huntington disease or specific forms of cerebellar ataxia, where we have different frequencies of repeat motive, CAG, CAG, CAG. And if this is below a critical cutoff, then everything is okay. If it's above a critical cutoff, patients developing symptoms. These repeat expansion regions have been extremely difficult in the past to get analyzed. Now also compare the upper lane HT38 with the T2T. -T. It is dramatically improved now with having that better reference. So make a long story short, I would say this paper is really revolutionizing now further on the quality of the interpretation of the genome data that have uh, been realized and is a really an important milestone in the detailed understanding of the real data of the genome. Let me start now with the first case. This is a young girl with behavioral abnormalities, delayed speech and language development, hyperactivity, intellectual disability, seizures, EEG abnormality, myoclonic seizures, and cognitive impairment. Whole exome was negative. 
you see the pedigree on the right side. Um, it is not evident whether there is really a consanguinity in that family existing. One of the reasons why we are actually developing based on the percentage of the homozygous variants you find in the chromosomes and in the genome, we are developing a score that tells us independently of the anamnesis or history with what likelihood there is a consanguinity existing in the family. So again, the whole exome was negative. We did the sequencing with the genome. It was rather easy, demonstrable, an 87 KB deletion. It is affecting parts of the both genes that have been depicted here. And especially the SCN1A gene is contributing to the clinical diagnosis of Strave syndrome. Strave syndrome is an epileptic encephalopathy and it is extremely important that the patients are early enough identified, characterized, and diagnosed because it has a direct impact on how we are treating the patients regarding the correct decision of the anti-epileptics we are using for those patients. Choosing the wrong ones, the inadequate ones, definitely affects the overall prognosis choosing the right ones significantly improves the overall prognosis of our patients. Therefore, genetics has a direct impact. This is a boy born in 2017 from a consanguineous Pakistani family with gait disturbance, myopathy, rhabdomyolysis, therefore periodic paralysis, lower limb pain, diarrhea, and elevated circulating creatinine kinase concentration, which is reflecting that the muscle is being affected. The vest again, or the whole axome was negative. So if you analyze this from the clinical perspective, it is clear the muscle is in the center of the differential diagnosis. However, not so easy to understand how we should uh, interpret the lactic acidosis and the diarrhea. So West negative, we did the whole genome. It was originally being suspected from the doctors, from the colleagues, that this might be Lundgirdle muscular dystrophy, which was not very likely to be honest because LGMD is typically not causing a massive increase of the CK and is also not causing a rhabdomyolysis. So it is fair without knowing the details to think about but in this precise case, not very likely that this was be really uh, to be suspected LGMD. McArdle might have been indeed a glycogenosis uh, disease, a differential diagnosis, but also McArdle is typically not causing rhabdomyolysis in such patients. So we did the whole genome. We could demonstrate a homozygous deletion missed by the whole exome. I guess you can see this very nicely in the upper lane. And this is resulting in because it's affecting a gene that is called LPIN1 for the exon 19 that is causing, in the case it is defect, the so called autosomal recessive myoglobinuria or ARMU abbreviated. The symptoms, according to the literature, muscle pain, muscle weakness a red color urine because of the rhabdomyolysis, fatigue, fever, nausea, vomiting, so also gastroenterological symptoms that had also been described in our patients. If not treated, myoglobinuria can lead to significant complications. So it can disturb the ion concentration in the blood with a consequence of arrhythmia or cardiac arrest and it can also cause significant kidney injury because of the high myoglobin and the high CK. What are we doing? We are treating in the case if there is an iron uh, problem in the blood, for example, hyperkalemia, we might um, give some mannitol and furosemid to prevent a kidney involvement. Fasting has to be avoided, very important, and also a potential febrile situation, fever has to be treated. And once we went back to the family, it was evident 
that this rhabdomyolysis was typically associated with fever situations. Therefore, important to get the diagnosis to improve the overall prognosis. However, this would not explain the entire phenotype. Therefore, not a big surprise, we identified a second disease. And this is a single axon heterozygous deletion of a 31 KB uh, stretch that causes the so-called Schmidt metaphysial chondrodysplasia or SMCD abbreviated. Might cause short stature. Uh, there is actually no treatment available. It's a rather mild to moderate phenotype. So this is not preferentially actually affecting our patient. However, important to be aware that again, we have two diseases and two diagnoses in our patients. So the summary, we have the LPIN1 causing the rhabdomyolysis, and we have the col 10 a one heterozygous deletion that uh, is slightly pathogenic like the other variant as well, causing the metaphysial dysplasia. Case number three, that's a young patient with hearing impairment, recurrent otitis media, abnormality of eye movement and hyperactivity, you see the complex pedigree on the right side. Again, the axon was negative. What did we do? We analyzed with the whole genome and identified again two diagnoses. We identified a, a very rare disease. It's called Sifrim Heights Weiss syndrome, which is a complex combination of different phenotypes. And on the other side, we identified uh, at chromosome 13, a homozygous deletion at a given uh, stretch that causes the deafness type 1A. The lesson I would love to show again also with this case, don't stop searching after finding a single relevant hit. Depending on the extent and the percentage of consanguinity in a given uh, ethnicity, you have to expect 4 to 11% of children with at least two monogenic diseases. Therefore, the detailed analysis of the phenotype and the documentation of the symptoms is so critical for our patients. Next case. Next case is the combination of seizures, global developmental delay, or reflexia, failure to thrive, decreased body weight, Central, central hypotonia, and again, severe hearing impairment. Whole axome again was negative. Here we have a consanguineous family as shown in the pedigree. What did we identify? We identified on the one side, a rather simple, very well-known genetic disease. It's called mycopolysaccharidosis type 3B or San Filippo or MPS. 3B abbreviated. However, most important, we also identified as a, you can say it, a secondary or incidental finding a mutation that causes a long QT syndrome affecting the heart rhythm. This is a relevant disease because it can result in unexpected heart arrest. It can be easily treated Therefore, this is a classical example how important it is also to think in the future more in preventing problems and diseases instead of just diagnosing diseases. Case number five, one-year-old male child, consanguineous family from Peshawar, so the border to Afghanistan and Pakistan. You see a rather severely affected child you see the informative pedigree. In the child, we have seen microcephaly, irritability, hyperhidrosis, recurrent infections, global developmental delay, again, failure to thrive, developmental regression, and in the MRI, also the brain atrophy. From the clinical perspective, if you would summarize it, and this is what I always love to do, first building a hypothesis from the clinical uh, reading and the manifestation with highest likelihood, this is a neurometabolic disorder uh, according to the clinical information. And 
Kravi disease might be, so one of the lysosomal storage disorders, which is an autosomal recessive neurodegenerative disorder, might be indeed an important differential diagnosis in this patient. So let me quickly introduce and remind you, autosomal recessive means the parents are carriers, healthy carriers, and with a statistical risk of 25%, the parents are transmitting the mutated variant of the same gene to the next generation. So in statistics, every fourth child of the family might be affected by uh, the mutation. So we see this for sure much frequently in the much more frequently in the consanguineous uh, ethnicities, especially in the Arabic population but also in other ethnicities, think about the Jewish Ashkenazi or geographical areas all over the globe where we have isolated ethnicities and populations with a very low level of mobility and therefore typically the higher likelihood that the family is marrying always uh, within the same family. For Krabi disease, also called the globoid cell leukodystrophy, we know in the MIVA very well that the most important form is the infantile form. That means it starts very early, typically in the first one to six months to get symptomatic. We have also an adult form of the Krabi disease. However, this reflects only roughly about eight to 14% in our patients. The disease mechanism is a very important one. And let me quickly explain the disease to you. So you are aware that all neurons, central neurons, as well as peripheral neurons, have a myelin sheet. And with this myelin sheet, we are realizing a much faster transmission within the axon. So it means the passage of messages along the axon is being affected negatively if we have a loss of the myelin, which we also call the demyelination. In the normal case, we have a full myelination of all of the axons in the peripheral nerve system with some exceptions of the very small unmyelinated ones and the majority of the axons in the brain as well myelinated. If we have a mutation, in the gene that causes Krabbe disease, this is resulting in galactosylceramidase deficiency. And because of that, the body is building a small molecule, psychosine named, which is highly toxic. And as a consequence, we see the degeneration or the damage of the myelin shown on the right side in red. This process we name demyelination. As a consequence, the transmission of messages along the axon is affected. We see interestingly, and this is one of the very few diseases, a combination of central neurological symptoms, like for example, developmental regression, like for example, problem with the vision or the speech. And on the other side, also the involvement of the peripheral nerve system. As a neurologist, it's typically that you are talking about two completely separated worlds, words, number one, the central, number two, the peripheral. But here in Krabbe disease, we see it combined because the mechanism is the damage of the myelin, which is of relevant in the central as well as in the peripheral nerve system. We have identified in the meanwhile several patients from a rather big cohort of more than 1,000 patients in Pakistan in sequence with the whole genome. You see, it's a rather uniform picture if we have the early manifestation. Uh, because of the consanguinity, homozygous mutations are in the overall majority, the case in those ethnicities, the consanguinity is also reflected by the majority of the pedigrees we always take with us. Genetic testing is absolutely critical in Krabi disease. It is in the meanwhile, the golden standard to get the patients easily and quickly diagnosed. An early diagnosis is absolutely critical. It is unfortunately still the case that typically the first child that is getting identified to be affected 
uh, is the child that has the longest diagnostic odyssey in the majority of the families. The second and the third is diagnosed much faster, which is for sure a catastrophe for the first child, a benefit for the second or the third child in the same family. Stem cell transplantation is quite favorable for the patients. A good enzyme replacement treatment is actually not yet uh, existing. Therefore, also preventive methods like prenatal testing or PGD and PGS are absolutely important. Again, everything is based on the genetic testing. The last case I would like to present to you again is a carrier testing. Carrier testing is typically done either in high risk populations where we know that there is a high likelihood, especially if the couple is coming from the same tribe or from the same family, that in the next generation and the kids generation, there might be a child being affected or we are doing that if there was only an affected child, however, the child passed away and therefore no diagnostic opportunity is available for that child. Therefore, we are testing the parents. We call this the carrier testing. Here, we have always to be aware that parents have a significant positive contribution from the early knowledge, whether they are at risk. And this is always the case if there are either the same mutation or different mutations on both parents existing in the same gene, that they are at risk to have an affected child with a likelihood of 25%. If we think about carrier testing, the genome is in the meanwhile, again, the golden standard, because it's also addressing so nicely the structural variants that are typically missed by more or less all alternative technologies. Have in mind that this is not a rare event, roughly four to 5% of all couples with recurrent miscarriages, one or both parents have a balanced translocation. And for that, we ideally should always take the uh, uh, whole genome sequencing. These are the classical pedigrees we get from our partners, we get from our patients that are being put on paper, where finally they ask, can you support us in allowing us a carrier testing to be aware whether there is any measurable risk for us to have an affected child? Carrier testing, especially in highly concerned in the schools, is in the meanwhile from some governments covered. Some governments are not yet doing that. And for sure, it is extremely critical to prevent that a child might be affected from an otherwise intreatable disease. So an example of what does it mean? A consanguineous family, we received the information from the index patient, unfortunately passed away. So what are the key features? Hyperammonemia hyperglycemia, developmental regression, motor delay, metabolic acidosis, abnormalities of the lymph bone, for example, diffuse cerebral atrophy and seizures. You see the pedigree on the right side, ne negative whole axon sequencing. We did the genome and we could very clearly demonstrate a 450 KB heterozygous duplication which is missed, not a big surprise, by the alternative technologies. This is demonstrable for the father and for the mother. So very clear, now we can offer either prenatal testing or PGD, PTS to our parents. What is the take home message I would like to give you today on your way? Whole genome is already per today the golden standard in genetic testing. Let me remind you with close to 80% of diagnostic sensitivity, it is on the top as a one fits it all technology to identify the patients and to offer an early diagnosis to these patients. Get the patients early identified because we are aware loss of time means a loss of quality of life. What we have learned that the most updated reference genome information, think about the T2T, has a traumatic impact on the quality. And last but not least, repeated analysis of existing sequences improves the diagnostic yield 
one of the reasons why we are continuously updating, reanalyzing re the existing data to the benefit of our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ant. I, you, you get an applause from me, I'm sure, from the rest of the people in front of the screens as well. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Very insightful as always. And it's impressive to see uh, the superiority of EGS versus best specifically based on this real life case. And I think the takeaway message, uh, your position, it's really on the lines why it's the golden uh, standard for genetic testing and diagnostics. Now, I see we have uh, quite some questions coming from the audience. Uh, also, those people raising their hands, uh, please uh, write down your message in the Q&A section. And I welcome Dr. Olaus Kahina. Ola, you're very welcome. Uh, as always, looking forward for the Q&A between you and Aunt. You're still on mute. Hi, <laughs> Ola, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. We have various questions and comments, so we will um, start addressing them. So uh, first question, uh, currently we have a uh, short read sequencing technology offered by Illumina or BGI and long read sequencing technology as PacBio and Oxford Nanopore sequencing. What would you recommend to use for diagnosis? Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, there are a lot of technical advantages talking about the long read sequencing technology, especially from PacBio. However, these technologies still have the limitation that they have difficulties to get established as a high throughput technology. And we would love to see the genetics really as the basis in the future for every normal genetic diagnostic and medical diagnostic step. Therefore, we need high, through, uh, high throughput technologies. And number two, still more expensive. So it's a price topic. So I would say for the next two to three years, the short read technology, because we have better bioinformatic pipelines, we have plenty of applications coming from the last 15 years will be still the golden standard. I could imagine that in three to five years, the long read have in dedicated indications like repeat expansions or like a rapid uh, um, a diagnosis where it is necessary. Think about the NICU indication, severely affected children at the intensive care unit, or for infectious genetics, the long read might have its market. However, make a long story short, still the short reads are the golden standard for the clinical routine testing. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for introducing a new uh, reference genome. Could you please comment on this? For the cases you presented, was T2T used as the reference genome or HD38? Yeah, thank you. Good question. Now, for those cases I have shown to you, we have still used, because these are the cases from end of the last year, beginning of this year, we have used the standard HD38. So in these cases, we have not yet used the T2T. Uh, thank you. Uh, the knowledge of the ethnicity, as you mentioned, is extremely important for the diagnostic accuracy. Do you take the information about ethnicity that was provided to you, or do you do pre-check of the ethnicity before you start whole genome analysis? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Let me quickly emphasize, indeed, the knowledge of the ethnicity has a dramatic impact on the quality of the proper interpretation of the data set. We have shown, and we will recently publish the data, that if you take, for example, for the Arabic population, the European reference genome, you end up automatically in about 18 to 23% misdiagnosis rate, just because you are not using the proper reference. Having said that, with highest likelihood, this is the case for more or less all of the different ethnicities. Therefore, we always ask from the very beginning, very precisely, what is the ethnicity of the index patient? However, non-experts might be confused by such a question. Also, sometimes doctors have difficulty to understand the background. Therefore, we are actually working on establishing an ancestry-like tool that gives us, based on our own database, but also based on available data, the very precise information where the patient we are just analyzing is coming from. 
So we try to answer it from both sides, the anamnesis and the history and the information from the, from the patient himself. And on the other side, the sequencing data we are generating because it has a dramatic impact to have the best quality of the diagnosis for the cases. Thank you. Uh, would you recommend carrier testing for all couples or only for those that are consanguineous? I guess it's a little bit a question of um, money, to be honest. The test is with, uh, roughly about 750 US dollars, a relevant bunch of money, no doubt. However, uh, if we think about the risk, especially in couples where uh, the couples are getting older and especially in the situation where we have couples from consanguineous environment, in these indications, I would definitely recommend do always the carrier test. If there is not yet an index patient existing that can be tested, or if you have from the rest of the family, definitely some uh, uh, anamnesis in that direction. Therefore, in consanguineous environment, we clearly see a high need close to have a must to do the carrier testing. For the non-consanguineous, it depends a little bit how careful and how preventive you are already thinking about increasing the situation, having a healthy baby. Thank you very much. Uh, for the patients with um, request for the in vitro fertilization, do you recommend to do the genetic testing before implantation? And if yes, uh, please explain. Well, that's a rather difficult question. I would say, Ola, we know who has addressed the question. I could imagine where it's coming from. Yes, for sure. We should do in such patients always the genetic testing. Uh, we know that the topic of infertility, if this is the background of the question, has a, a percentage of 30 to 60 percent where the reason is genetically based. And therefore, we should always understand the, the precise case. Uh, but maybe we can here answer also a little bit more extensively with a written uh, mail or uh, Thank you. Uh, and also direct to customer question, I assume. So uh, how should I know which clinical information I should provide you in order to be diagnosed if I have plenty of documents from doctors? Excellent question. Easy answer. Document everything what you have. Our experts are happy to extract the critical information. And sometimes not being an expert, it's really difficult to understand what is really an important message and maybe what is not so relevant. Therefore, just document everything, either by just uploading documents or use a free field just to type all of the information. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a great question also from Professor from Georgia. Uh, during carrier testing, would uh, variants of uncertain significance for recessive conditions be reported? Because there is an issue of interpretation and um, for such cases. Could you please explain this? Yes, for the carrier testing, we report pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants and the strong RUS, as we call it. This is a variant of unclear significance that is fulfilling in principle all of the formal requirements to be a likely pathogenic, but a small piece might miss. And therefore we call it strong bus, and therefore we report it. And what is also of relevance, I have mentioned it during the last webinar I have, a webinar I have given, uh, we are continuously updating the report. So every quarter we send out an updated report if there is a, a new understanding, a new data set, internal data, published data that changes the classification, it will be immediately and automatically reported. Um, there is a question. Uh, could you please explain which types of cancer you can detect with the current uh, technology? Yeah, this is rather simple. Uh, what I've presented today we are talking about germline variants. So we are not talking about somatic variants. For the somatic variants, as you are aware, we have to isolate the DNA from typically the tumor tissue. 
Everything what I have presented today is based on the buckle swap sampling. So a very convenient, very easy at home, doable sampling, no blood drawing necessary. So sometimes with a smile in the face, I say no pain for our children because no needle is necessary, no blood is necessary. So everything is based on the buckle swap, therefore germ lines. However, what we're learning, depending on what tumors we are talking about, in five up to 20% of tumors, we know that they are germ line based on the one side. And on the other side, and this is a further fascinating element in whole genome, take the colon cancer as an example, we are aware that we are understanding better and better the cascade story of different tumors. It means that a single mutation event is just slightly increasing the risk to develop a cancer. But if there is a second, a third, a fourth, or a fifth event, then it is a massive increase of the risk of the cancer. And what technology is easier to get used to identify the polygenic events in the DNA of the individual? And this is the genome. Therefore, there is a very fascinating paper, I guess, just published last week from the Genomic England uh, team demonstrating that the genome being used in a much broader range. And you might be aware that the Genomic England project is a project that has been funded by the British government, allowing every citizen in the UK that is suffering from a cancer to get access to the genome. Based on this data set that has in the meanwhile reached more than 100,000 uh, patients, uh, it has been published that the percentage of the germline based cancer is obviously significantly higher than we would have expected from the existing publication. So we believe positioning the genome as the golden tool only even if you're doing the germline, don't somatic anyway, yeah, is the most important next step in the early identification and prevention of cancer. Thank you very much. And I ask the last question and then the rest can be for sure addressed online. For the cases you have presented, did you need to sequence parents to identify the diagnosis uh, in individuals? Oh, that's an excellent question. Thank you for addressing this question, Ola. Um, we are aware that in the majority of the technologies, the trio analysis, that means index plus the parents, is significantly increasing the likelihood that the individual index is properly diagnosed. However, with the genome, we already have using the solo an extraordinary high diagnostic yield of 77%. In the next step we analyze, can we further increase the diagnostic rate if we compare a cohort of solo-based diagnosed patients with a trio-based cohort and a third cohort, can we improve the diagnosis quality for those that have not been identified being a solo with a genome, that means the 23%. And interestingly, in contrast, for example, to the exome, and in contrast, for example, also to panels, we do not see a significant further improvement of the diagnostic rate using the trio compared to the solo. Having said that, we have decided to follow the following strategy. We do the genome from the index and every variant this is of relevance. So typically the primary and the secondary event, we confirm for the parents with the Sanger sequencing, just to demonstrate the transmission, just to demonstrate the allelity and the face, and just to demonstrate, especially in autosomal dominant diseases, whether this is a de novo mutation, yes or no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to both of you for this uh, wonderful discussion. It's uh, always always super interesting listening to it. Um, now it's up to me to wrap up this uh, webinar for today. I have three more points I would like to share with you. Uh, the first one is, if you liked it today, um, I would be very happy to, and we would all be very happy to invite you to the next two webinars. 
uh, also in the same constellation. So we will have uh, all our speaking on genetic diagnosis um, is the first step for a better future. We will highlight uh, how we can serve in a preventive matter. And armed uh, with the third part of our webinar series, similar today, we will also use real life cases to show uh, how VGS was used to detect uh, the, and to diagnose the patients uh, where other uh, techniques fail. So we will be very happy to um, see you there, invite you. Uh, looking forward to those two events. Um, the second part I'd like to address is the attending NCME certificate. Um, so as you can see in the chat uh, below on your Zoom screen, we have posted a link. This link will take you to a, uh, to a web formula. Uh, it looks similar to on the left here. If you please fill out your full name, your email, the institution, and if you are uh, uh, want to have the CME points, uh, we will make sure you receive them within 10 working days. Uh, if you have any questions, you can message us at any time. And uh, that's basically it from our side. So the last point I wanted to mention was just a big thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, it's a pleasure having you aboard. I'm happy to see we have uh, far over 100 doctors from all over the world joining in. Um, if you have feedback to us, if you'd like to know something else, uh, feel free to message us at any time. And I uh, hope to see you soon next time.